Gary Gibbon, today we're going to talk about Britain after Boris Johnson, the two candidates who want to be prime minister and the future of the Conservative Party. What are you going to tell me? Well, today we're going to look at what, what this contest is going to look like in the remaining weeks. What on earth it is that the Conservative Party is wrestling with here. It started with the issue of trust, but it now seems to be about direction. And whether they can pull it back. Boris Johnson's plummeted their popularity. Can they still win? Gary, before we get into the sort of nitty gritty of Tory party policy and where the party goes from here, I just want to quickly discuss the next steps. In two weeks, we've gone from eight candidates to two. We know the next leader will either be Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss. We'll find out in early September. That's over a month away from now. I mean, now that it goes to the Tory party members, is this the boring bit, the interesting bit in terms of what, where the campaign is going There is here. a boring bit, and I think it's the very last phase of this constituency uh, members' uh, ballot because an awful lot of them vote early and the candidates know that, so you're going to see very front-loaded campaigns. So you're, you're still going to get, a, if you have a sort of bloodlust, you're still going to get a bit of sort of Tory noir action uh, and there are going to be two TV debates that we know of there's going to be an awful lot of activity. The, both candidates are going to be trying to get a lot of stuff into their shop window, endorsements, policy announcements. So it, it, the next 10 days is going to be uh, at least two weeks, three weeks, is going to be pretty lively. The back end of this whole constituency process, though, ballots arrive on the doormats uh, starting the 1st of August. And everything that we know about Conservative Party members tells us they tend to deal with items of post rather promptly. Uh, and so the fear in Team Sunak is that uh, a lot of Tory members will vote early and Rishi Sunak is under no illusions. He starts with the constituency section behind and he needs to turn around opinion and he hasn't got long to do it. Is it true that they, though, can change their mind in terms of voting? Yes. The way the system uh, operates, if you decide that you, when you voted early, you made a mistake and you actually want to vote the other way, you can now vote a second time, put your special ID numbers in there, and that second vote will, be, will, will override the initial one. How many people actually get around to doing that? I don't know. But there was pressure from Team Sunak to try and delay the uh, issuing of the ballot papers because they... They're very conscious of this, that uh, right now they're uh, behind and uh, they would like more time to make up ground. But they weren't allowed that. But they do get this uh, override uh, facility sort of spelt out by the party. So that's some small comfort. But I really can't see that many people getting around to changing their vote. And as you say, Rishi Sunak has been quite open that he starts from behind. But obviously he was ahead in all of the polls done of Tory MPs. What does that say about the difference between the MPs and the members? that Rishi Sunak is a clear favourite amongst the MPs. Well, I'm, not sure. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure he is yet, because he got 38% of the MPs. Boris Johnson and Theresa May ended up with well over 50% of MPs. It is interesting, though. I think what uh, Rishi Sunak is hoping he can do in the next few days is get to a position where he gets so many endorsements from the MPs who haven't declared yet or were Penny Mordaunt uh, supporters that he that will get him to the 50% uh, plus that he never got during the um, MPs' ballots. But it is an interesting question, where are the MPs compared with the constituency associations? If you go back a few decades, there was no question whatsoever. The associations tended to be more right-wing, drier on social issues and on economics than the MPs. Um, but I think most people would now think, looking at the data, that in, in some ways uh, some of the MPs are um, drier than the members. We're going to get the truth on all of that by the beginning of September, but it is a bit of an unknown. At the very beginning of this campaign, there was, a, there was talk amongst the One Nation group of MPs, the sort of people who were backing Tom Tugendhat and Jeremy Hunt, uh, that there had been a sort of blood transfusion that went on in Conservative membership. A whole load of people came into the Conservative Party in order to make sure that Brexit happened, to make sure that Boris Johnson got the leadership, and that some of those people had subsequently drifted away, and that the Conservative Party's centre of gravity had moved a bit more towards the uh, One Nation 
uh, group. Well, we don't see very strong evidence of that, but we will know the truth of it in a few weeks' time. And what does it say about the Tory party members then that Liz Truss seems to be the favourite? Is that because Rishi is so unpopular because he's seen as sort of, you know, the socialist chancellor not going along with Tory party principles? There's definitely a bit of that that uh, Team Rishi are picking up. There's also uh, the Boris assassin. Uh, These are uh, members who were cheering Boris Johnson to the rafters until recently. Some of them very uncomfortable with what was going on, but some of them uh, still true believers, and they're scratching their heads wondering whether the party has done, as Michael Fabricant said in the penultimate Prime Minister's questions, whether they've uh, made a huge mistake and done what Michael Fabricant's point was, but done what the Labour Party did, getting rid of Tony Blair, the, the real election winner. And some uh, of them have uh, written in to, to ask whether Boris Johnson can actually stand again, haven't they? Yeah, there is a, uh, a bit of a project, uh, and quite a few of them have signed up. I think it's as we speak, I think it's uh, 3,000 or so, I can't remember, who said, can we have Boris Johnson's name on the ballot paper? It's a fairly fatuous exercise, but one that is funded by a Tory donor. So uh, it's got perhaps more legs than it deserves on logical grounds. And does that then, again, show the sort of divide between MPs and party members? That is, MPs who ultimately kicked him out, but it's party members who might regret it? Yeah, would the party members, if it had been a vote of no confidence, so to speak, that was open to them, would they have voted 50% plus one, uh, to get rid of Boris Johnson. I'm not sure they would have done, and that is one of the problems that uh, Rishi Sunak has. And even amongst people who may have, in their heart of hearts, wanted Boris Johnson gone, they still feel uncomfortable about the way they think Rishi Sunak has been working at this campaign for a long time, maybe had it in mind for a long time, and you know, that, that jars with some of them. So he's got some real problems to overcome there, but he thinks he can do it with this fundamental message, which he thinks whatever the polls say at the moment, will chime with the Tory members, which is you can't spend money you haven't got. Uh, If Labour is mocking the Tory party for uh, black hole uh, economics, spending money you haven't got, borrowing excessively, uh, then the raison d'etre of the Tory party has disappeared, he will say. Of course, the other thing he's going to say again and again is I'm the only one who can win an election. Liz Truss is not sellable to the British electorate. And I guess that's obviously ultimately one of the reasons why MPs finally kicked out Boris Johnson was, you know, Partygate, the allegations around the MP Pincher and his, you know, Johnson's lying around that. And ultimately the idea that Boris Johnson could no longer win an election. But we've spoken many times before about when Johnson might go, if he might go. And the concern was always, well, who steps into that void? And it was always seen that Rishi Sunak wasn't quite right, nor Liz Truss. And yet here we are. I mean, is there a sense here that Boris Johnson does still sort of loom over this as you may have kicked him out, but these guys just aren't up to it, perhaps. You, you hear that a lot. Uh, you hear it amongst uh, some of the loyalist MPs. Uh, you hear it from uh, t- Tory activists. Yeah, Boris Johnson is haunting this contest. As some people put it, who are on the right of the party, if what we have done at the end of these 10 weeks, they say, or whatever, is remove Boris Johnson but put in Liz Truss, who is sort of continuity Boris Johnson, without the laughs, without the charisma, without the connection uh, with Red Wall voters. You know, what on earth was this for? Um, and of course, there's sort of some, some short-term memory uh, issues here because there was an enormous problem with trust and trust in Boris Johnson. But people just look at the stand back and look at this and think, oh my God, we've, we've replaced a hugely charismatic figure potentially uh, with someone who is, as Ms. Truss herself uh, said in the second TV debate, not exactly slick. And also when you talk about, you know, the issue of trust with Boris Johnson and the need to sort of cut off from his administration, we have two candidates who were part of his <laughs> not the, the, the two most established faces uh, of his cabinet. And we had campaigns, Kimmy Badenoch and Tom Tugendhat in particular, but Penny Morden to an extent, that were saying, we need a fresh start. We need a face that hasn't been round the top table. And that resonated with a lot of members, not to mention some people, uh, some people Tory supporters uh, more widely in the country. And you've ended up with the Foreign Secretary uh, and the man who's been Chancellor for two and a half years. And that reminds you, that, ha- that has echoes of how the Tory party used to select their leaders in the 1950s. You know, there'd be a few cosy chats at the top table in Buckingham Palace saying, well, which of these old boys do you, do you rate? And it would nearly always be the uh, people in the highest office. Now, of course, you could say there's, you, you've got a, a guy with an a, a ethnic minority background and a woman uh, coming out of this, so it looks a bit different. But that, your point is well made. You've got the two biggest figures 
uh, from Boris Johnson's administration who are supposed to give you a clean break from it. That, that's, that's a tricky sell. Boris Johnson obviously won't announce who his preferred candidate is, but you were saying the other day that Downing Street were texting MPs saying that, you know, Penny Morden and Rishi Sunak, no, no, one's a snake, the other's a moron. What's their concern about them two? And is it because... What, does Boris Johnson think that he might have a future in a Liz Truss cabinet? I don't think he wants to uh, serve under anyone. I don't think that's how Boris Johnson sees himself. There's a uh, one rumour that goes the rounds in Westminster that uh, he, he wants to watch arms folded uh, as uh, Liz Truss implodes and a grateful nation and party comes begging for him to take over the helm again. What he, he still sees the comeback. I, I, I don't necessarily buy that, but he's... Clearly, some I, I don't buy that it could happen, but some people who are close to him uh, have heard him nod towards this. So, but he won't. Will he, will he be like a Theresa May, sort of quietly every now and again, sort of nudging government, or will he be more quiet? Well, we don't know, and I suspect he doesn't fully know. We do know that um, he generally, when he's out of office, likes to make a lot of money, and that means probably it takes you away from the House Commons because you. One of the things about the House of Commons is that you have to declare it, and, and some people find that rather un, uncomfortable. I can't see him looking at Theresa May and thinking, well, her post number 10 approach is a template for me. I can't see him thinking anything Theresa May does is a template for him. So he, he'll do it differently. I doubt um, he'll be back in number 10 or, or back in government. Uh, I think he'll be making lots of money and also trying to make sure that he, he clearly wants to polish his burnish his legacy and you could see him doing some sort of role as I don't, I'm making this up now but uh, envoy for Ukraine around the world taking a huge interest in in Ukraine and maybe some other causes as well that uh, leveling up perhaps or something like that which he feels is associated with his brand you could see him doing stuff like that but quietly sitting on the back benches trotting into the tea rooms in the House of Commons he was never a great House of Commons mm. man when he was a backbencher when he was a Foreign Secretary, I just can't see him lapping that up. We've spoken many times about this idea of where is the uh, identity of the Conservative Party right now because it's become, in recent years, high tax, you know, big state, levelling up government intervention. And it feels like it's sort of lost its way and that was some of the concern. And now it feels that, you know, there's a real understanding of that and so everything has become, I'm going to be just like Thatcher, no more taxes. Is this this, this Tory party struggling to find its identity and just going back to the past? There is, a, there is a battle of ideas in the Tory party and there is a battle for the Thatcherite mantle because Rishi Sunak would say he is honouring Margaret Thatcher's traditions in balancing the books and, what, and if there was one central tenet of Thatcherism, it was that. It was you can't spend what you don't have. The kind of growth we need is not that kind of short-term growth that makes a situation worse uh, and pushes up interest rates much higher. The kind of growth we need is sustainable, that builds growth for the long run. Liz Truss is reaching into another bit of the Thatcher handbag and saying actually low taxes is what Margaret Thatcher always believed in, the idea that if you, if you cut taxes, growth will come. What is not affordable is putting up taxes, choking off growth, and ending up in a much worse position. There is a battle of ideas in the Tory party. A contest triggered by trust issues has now layered on top of it uh, this whole question about where does the Tory party go? What is it about? Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss were both like a smaller state, but whether you cut taxes immediately uh, or whether you have to wait really quite a long time in a high inflation environment is where the argument has settled right now. And I think that's going to run all the way through the remaining stages of the contest. Is the fact that they're now fighting on economics because that's firmer, more comfortable ground when it comes to the members? Because during the debates, there was all this issue about, I guess, let's call it, you know, woke policies, you know, trans rights, etc. Is this the idea that that kind of cultural stuff doesn't work? And actually, when it comes to the members, it's more about economics and a sort of firmer footing. Our own Channel 4 News poll about two weeks ago, seems like a lifetime now, uh, suggested that uh, the membership are not that interested in these culture war issues. Very fascinating finding in that poll, by the way, uh, was when you asked them where they stood, the members, on levelling up. The vast bulk of the Tory members are in the south southeast of England. And funny enough, they're not that mad keen on levelling up. Uh, it, was, it was 60% plus hostility to the idea in our poll. And you haven't heard 
the candidates talk much about it. Yes, they are currently trying to pander to where they think the members are, but at the same time, they've got to conduct themselves in public in a way that boosts their poll rating when all these pollsters poll the wider public as well, because that is the chisel with which uh, uh, Rishi Sunak hopes he can chip away at Liz Truss's lead, and that's how and Liz Truss needs to make a bit of a connection with them, because if her opinion poll ratings with the wider population go down, well, the Conservative members might just clock that. So is that quite a delicate balance for the campaign? Because I guess they're trying to appeal to the members who they're are in the South. They're definitely trying to appeal to the members, but they just can't afford to alienate the public too much. And I think Rishi Sunak's hope is that that is exactly what Liz Trust does. She gets that balance wrong. And so is the idea that the campaign will be very different to how they might govern? Because... You know, you're, you're not. They quite uh, often are, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, but you're not. You're not. They're not currently appealing to red wall voters, are they? Because they're not Tory party members. So if that means they'll have to govern in a com- completely different way. An awful lot of red wall voters are not screaming out for tax cuts. They're just talking about the cost of living, and you're you are not getting the debate that or the intray that the next prime minister uh, will be dealing with and talking about every day reflected in the debate at the moment. It feels like a parallel universe to a, a, a lot of voters, yeah. Which then goes to what we've always talked about, which is the idea, the dialogue has always been that post-Brexit, Labour's lost to figure out how it appeals to all of its base. But now we're talking about, you know, three separate pools of individuals, the MPs, the members, and then, well, the wider electorate, especially the Red Wall. And it's very difficult in some ways to try and knit them all together in one coherent ideology. Well, Boris... Johnson said in his last Prime Minister's questions, I realigned British politics. He was lavishing praise on himself and the final words he gave in the, uh, in the House of Commons. The, the, the last few years have been the greatest privilege of, of my life. And it's true that I, I helped to get the biggest Tory majority for 40 years yeah. and a, a huge realignment in UK politics, Mr Speaker. We've transformed our democracy and restored our national independence, as my right honourable friend says. And he has a point. Uh, most Tory MPs would privately admit to it. They struggle to see how anyone else is going to bind that incredibly broad coalition together. And it's not at all clear that they can. An awful lot of Tory MPs will tell you they think the next election is lost, whoever is elected, because they cannot see that coalition holding together. And you know, part of that is about the absence of Boris Johnson, but of course part of it is about the challenges which any Prime Minister would have struggled with, the cost of living uh, increase, and the pr- enormous pressure on services. Um, you know, we haven't talked much as a country for a wee while now because of the cost of living focus about the catch-up that is post-COVID still straining our services, uh, requiring cash and uh, often struggling. And those are the things that dominate people's lives and you've got to expect will dominate the election campaign when it comes. So so Tory MPs are resigned, as you say. Quite a few. Yeah. You do hear it a lot. And some of them, which I find breathtaking given that the Conservative Party exists to not because of an ology or an ism, but to hold on to power. Um, some of them actually say, I think we need a period in opposition to sort ourselves out. Hmm. And you scratch your head when you hear a Conservative MP uh, saying that, because for, for as long as I've ever dealt with them, it's in their DNA that it's all about staying in office. What does that point to? Does that point to an idea that they haven't got the right characters available and they need to sort of no. wait and see what happens? Or is it because they need some time to reflect? Yeah, they, they feel knackered, uh, yeah. uh, some of them. They think they've... Uh, run out of ideas. It's very difficult to um, re-engineer uh, your party's programme when you're in office. Um, so that's one component of it. For some of them, though, it's because they are quite ideological. Mm. They want. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you sometimes hear in parts of the Labour Party. Uh, we need to sort of purify ourselves again uh, with a spell in opposition. Um, again, something you just never used to hear from Conservatives. So this is a poison chalice then for whoever becomes the next Prime Minister? It's not an easy gig. Which is why they'll wait as long as possible for the next election, to try and buy themselves some... And, and Tory MPs are terrified of an early election. Yeah, and it is one of Rishi Sunak's weapons that he is deploying at the moment, saying, if you get this trust, you get a new policy, there's no way uh, you can it, implement that without getting a new mandate from the electorate. I'm not sure many MPs are buying that, but it's a way of trying to frighten the Conservative Party uh, into staying away from... This trust. And, and, and it was why Boris Johnson's um, threat, which he was trying when he was cornered by his party, uh, if you come for me, I'll 
call an early general election, I'll drive to the palace. Uh, it didn't resonate with anyone, either constitutionally or, or strategically. Nobody thought uh, he, he could do it, uh, and certainly nobody thought he should. So I guess, I mean, finally, Gary, I mean, the whole process of getting rid of Boris Johnson was this idea that he'd finally run out of road, there was no more room for manoeuvres, he was himself not going to work with the electorate. But is it a sort of sense of the Tories were damned if they do and damned if they don't? Because it feels like the next election was always going to be difficult to win whatever happened. And perhaps the Tory party now, without Johnson, is in just as bad a state, if not worse. That's what some people are going around saying. I think the polling that Boris Johnson was getting was of an order that just couldn't be turned around. Uh, His popularity around about January fell like a stone, uh, a boulder, uh, and and it wasn't coming back. And they will, some of them, for a long time probably, be looking over their shoulder, wondering what if. But I think that would be uh, delusional. Um, There was no coming back for Boris Johnson. Um, Who knows whether who replaces him can uh, pull it back a lot, but he certainly couldn't pull it back a bit. And the Conservative Party in a better state or a worse state now? Well, they're in a mess right now. They're beating each other up. Uh, and that I, I expect the polls will show a decent Labour lead. Depending on how the contest runs and how the new incumbent takes the helm, you would expect a honeymoon period. But what Labour's really keen to do, and, I, <laughs> and, and you can see it in everything Keir Starmer Uh, is saying at the moment is make sure they don't fall into the trap which they feel they did when Margaret Thatcher was deposed by the Tory party. Back then, Labour almost, as it were, sort of joined in the street party. And that meant that added luster to John Major uh, and and made him look like a clean break from the past. They are absolutely uh, determined, uh, the Labour leadership, to spray all Tories uh, with the muck spreader. Uh, and make sure that they are all tainted by uh, Boris Johnson's uh, own, as they see it, sins. And you know, the fact that the two candidates that the party is now choosing from and the people who are at the top table with Boris Johnson makes that just that bit easier. And very final thing, I, don't, I know you're not a betting man, but when would you predict the next election might be? May 2024? Hard to see it happening before that. Gary Gibbon, thank you very much. Thank you.